All right. Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to this session, uh, which is about uh, uh, creating economic opportunities uh, with uh, DHS2. Uh, we are actually supposed to have uh, uh, a couple of uh, presentations and also uh, some uh, colleagues from ODAIS group who can come and uh, give their testimonies on uh, working with DHS2, but unfortunately they are not they are not able to to come. So I will be doing this presentation uh, alone today. But uh, maybe the good thing is that we can have more time for discussion. All right. So my name is uh, Edem Kosi. I'm from uh, HISP uh, West and Central Africa. Uh, this presentation. Okay. Yeah. So during this presentation, I will be talking about the uh, HMS in pre DHS2 era, and then uh, the trans transformative impact of DHS2 in HMS and beyond the HMS. Uh, the career path we can have uh, working with DHS2, the business opportunities as individuals, but also as organization, and uh, uh, finish with uh, the specific case of uh, his groups. So, uh, as you can see, uh, before uh, DHS2 era, uh, that is, you know, when we talk about HMS, that's what people think of. And I remember I was uh, doing an assessment in uh, 2012 or 11 in one country. So I was talking to the HMS officer at the district level, and uh, he was like very depressed, negative on everything. And so, what is what is happening? It says, well, you know, um, in this country, when you are uh, sent to HMIS, it's like uh, you are, it's a punishment. It's uh, actually when you do something wrong and they want to get rid of you, they send you to, uh, to HMIS. So it was seen as uh, uh, a punishment and also a way of archiving. Uh, archiving both in terms of uh, document, but also putting people in archive. So you are no longer active. We put the so you are like uh, archive. So it was really uh, painful for people. It was not morally rewarding for people to be working with uh, HMIS. And uh, they were also feeling um, very marginalized. And um, at that time, there was no this uh, connected system. There's no web-based system where as a member of uh, the HMIS team, you, are, you can feel connected to other people. No, 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 that was not the case. They only have that uh, standalone uh, uh, software. If they have software, sometimes it's only paper, but if they have software, it's just standalone. You sit there, you do your data entry, paper will come, you do data entry. At the end of the month or the, uh, or the quarter, you take your file, your backup, you send it to someone else, and that's it. You are not talking to other people, you are just there. If someone needs something, maybe they will come to you and ask one or two questions, and that's it. And uh, of course, uh, doing this does not, or, or at least did not come with, you know, a sort of uh, joy. I mean, everything was like uh, very uh, less uh, colorful. I mean, you, you, you are just dealing with data, data entry, there's no nice visualization. And so you are not, uh, they, are, they are not excited about, about the work they are doing themselves and so forth. And then, when DHS2 came, uh, everything changed. I should also admit that uh, the arrival of DHS2 coincided with uh, many global initiatives as well. That brought uh, the, the importance to data to life and also brought also more funding, more uh, awareness in terms of uh, uh, what we can use data. So with DHS2, things have changed. And now people have this sense of uh, belonging to a community. At national level, you are connected to many other uh, people, your peers in the district. In other districts, you have this sense of a community, a national community. And sometimes now they even have a WhatsApp group and so forth where they can exchange or share their concern, support each other. And at the same time, you have this uh, broader global community of DHS2 where we are having regional and global academies, people are meeting each other, sharing experience, 
and so forth. And uh, they are also uh, sharing their, their wills. So you, uh, you say, okay, I, maybe in my work on the daily basis, I need this future, you share it. And maybe one or two years later, you get into DHS2, you feel that excitement of contributing to something and uh, uh, getting that thing shared with uh, other people. So that is a sort of uh, moral reward and also this uh, lifting uh, in terms of uh, uh, image. Uh, personally, I mean, reflecting on self and also uh, in the community. So that lifting was brought by not particularly DHS2, but it coincided with the arrival of uh, DHS2. So we can sort of link it to uh, DHS2 era uh, as well. So uh, in terms of uh, capacity building, that was also uh, a change. Now with DHS2 and uh, other uh, modern platform, uh, we were able to bring uh, better cap capacity building offerings. We have now, uh, it's not only on technical aspect of DHS2, but also beyond like data analysis, uh, data use, uh, um, assessments, uh, the lack of uh, doing uh, maturity profile, data governance, all these new topics around data are coming and people are now being skilled in various data-related domain. Uh, and uh, also uh, using this modern platform like DHS2, uh, we are also making connections with uh, broader IS topics like uh, IS architecture. We are now talking about how to build uh, or to develop sustainable uh, health architecture in countries. We are not talking about agriculture, education, and so forth. New topics like uh, data use, data demands, uh, One Health, electronic medical record, how to connect them. Uh, new guidelines are coming and we are training people on those guidelines and they are learning new principles that can be applied in other domain. And all this is at the same time, making people more uh, valuable uh, on the market because now that they have more skills in uh, either on technical aspect or non-technical aspects, then they can be able to sell themselves, their skills to, to other organizations. Maybe that's not what we really want for ministry or ministries because you want them to stay. But at the same time, since we are making them more valuable, then other people are interested on what they can get from them. Uh, so, uh, in terms of uh, uh, career path, um, through this um, DHS work that we are doing, now that we have DHS in countries, it, previously it was like maybe one person in a district working on his own computer and that's it. Now we bring in this collaborative aspect of the HMS and we need many people to connect to the same platform to do things. So in so doing, we are also creating a demand for more positions. So we are creating, we are giving the, the opportunity for those who are newly graduated also to get job either as data entry or to go to the district, serve as a data manager, and then learn or become a district HMS officers and so forth. And we have also seen in many uh, ministries where when we start with uh, uh, the team, then after a certain period, they get promoted. And I'm glad today to see in the participants that we have, many of them are now big directors of uh, the HMIS or MS unit, but they started from the lower level and now they are promoted as big director because they had that opportunity to, uh, to be part of this initiative that brought some results. And sometimes there is people who were they were not directors, but they believed in this because they saw this opportunity to work with this attractive platform. They were the champions, and now they are visible, and they got promoted. Uh, yeah, this one is also a bit uh, controversial. Again, uh, because now people are getting these uh, new skills. They know DHS2, either by working with ministries or going to various uh, training opportunities and so forth. Now, many are able to work with uh, international NGOs with better salaries. And again, we are complaining because they are poaching on sometime on uh, uh, ministry uh, staff. And this morning we heard uh, the talk from uh, the South Sudan saying that sometimes 
they, they hired the same people from the ministry and then uh, uh, taking them back for the segment and so forth. So yes, that is uh, the, the downside of it. But at least for people at individual level is about getting more and we cannot uh, prevent people from seeking uh, better conditions and so forth. Um, the other uh, possibility uh, that we have is that we have also many uh, uh, HM or ministry staff working on this kind of project, GHS2 project, and uh, at the end of the project or at, at one point, uh, they have the opportunity to get scholarship to do either uh, master or PhD programs. And there are many here who have started uh, within the ministry and who had the opportunity to come here uh, in Oslo to do their PhD in, uh, in DHS2. Uh, myself, I'm uh, one of the examples, although I was not initially from the Ministry of Health, uh, I came, was not even part of uh, the, the, the government, but by working with DHS2, I was able to get that opportunity to come here and do my PhD. And now uh, I'm, I'm working, I'm still working with DHS too, and I'm happy with what I'm doing. I can live out of what I'm doing. So uh, in terms of uh, business opportunities, uh, what do we have, uh, particularly at uh, uh, individual uh, level? Uh, as I said before, now if you have this uh, DHS2 skills, you are highly in demand on the market. And we know in many countries, people are looking for people with uh, DHS2 skills, and you can see even with uh, sometimes with uh, some uh, uh, posts that are not even specific to data management, they will say, okay, DHS2 knowledge is a, is a bonus or it's a plus. So having DHS2 uh, skills is, is making people more valuable in the, uh, in the market. Uh, we, you also have the, this opportunity to work as a consultant. And we know that WHO, for instance, has many consultants uh, only work, mainly working on DHS2. They are going to countries to do DHS2 related work. And if uh, you, your skills is beyond just doing customization and uh, you, have, uh, you know how to do software development, then that is even uh, uh, greater because then you can start developing apps because you have now this DHS2 platform uh, on top of which you can develop your own apps. And I have the case of uh, one guy from uh, uh, Uganda who developed this uh, cause of death app. And uh, he's, I won't say selling it, but uh, he did it with, in partnership with WHO. And uh, because of that, he had this opportunity to go to many countries to do this. So you have the opportunity to develop your own app and then have your business model around it, either through implementing, or if you want to give it for free, open source, or whatever, you have that opportunity. And uh, you have also with this new DHS2 uh, app, uh, uh, app shell coming in, you have also the possibility to do many other things. Like for instance, uh, yesterday I was discussing with uh, the, the core team uh, members here, and I was telling them that Right now, I feel personally like the graphic theme of uh, DHS2 is still a bit pale. So, and uh, we can see from other uh, platforms that they have this uh, graphic theme that people can even sell, even though it's an open source system. So you can develop your own graphic theme, very nice with uh, better colors and so forth. And you can just sell them and people will buy. So you have that opportunity as uh, DHS2 or someone with DHS2 skills. And we also have uh, many people uh, working with ministries of health or education and culture with DHS2 uh, skills who now have additional job in terms of uh, lecturing in training institutions, can be uh, in education, uh, IT, e-health, or whatever. I've seen it in many countries. And uh, in so doing, they are able to earn more uh, in terms of uh, resources. So uh, at uh, us uh, organizations, uh, we now have 
many organizations living or getting their earning based on GHS2. So if you can uh, offer uh, services like uh, uh, app development, hosting, data integration, uh, training support, data analysis, AI, or whatever that can be connected to GHS2, then definitely as an organization, you can get more business opportunity and to, to, to earn more. And we have the like of uh, uh, BAO systems doing hosting, for instance, and also offering data integration services, uh, software development. You have Blue Square uh, developing analytics uh, uh, apps to help people to have better analytics or more uh, output out of GHS2. You have the lack of GSI doing also uh, GHS2 implementation or HMS in general, but also offering some services like data quality and so forth. And this organization, I mean, I just name a uh, few here, but you have many of them uh, getting more business opportunities by working with DHS2. Uh, so, to the particular case of uh, uh, his groups, uh, maybe some may know what is his group, uh, some may not know, but uh, his group, uh, they can be for profit or not for profit, this group set by one or a couple of people. Uh, most of them are alumni from uh, this house, from uh, uh, University of Oslo. And that is uh, my, my own case. But the good thing is that these, his groups, that started like uh, uh, 10, 5, or 20 years ago, are now able to create job opportunities for many. You have some his group who have like more than 100 staff, some are in terms of dozens or two, three, four, but still uh, they have this unique opportunity to offer uh, employment for people and also to create more opportunities in countries, either through the DHS2 academies that they are organizing, uh, the capacity or whatever they are doing with uh, universities, the fact that they are supporting the ministries and organizations to bring in more projects, more project meaning, uh, more funding, more funding meaning, more employment opportunities, and also contributing to uh, economic growth. And uh, the projects can span from education to agriculture. We have now climate, climate coming in, we have the One Health, and so forth. So the opportunities are sort of uh, uh, endless. Um, yeah, so uh, still on the his groups, uh, I will say that although the his groups are there for many years, they are doing uh, a lot of things, uh, there are always needs with uh, his groups. I mean, they, they are expanding, and they, if you reach out to his group, you will notice that there are always job opportunities, either as being there in terms of uh, uh, permanent staff, but also to work as a consultant for his group. And in our case, we have a huge network of uh, uh, consultants with whom we, we usually work with because we don't need, sometimes we need some uh, uh, expertise, but not on a permanent basis. So that's the case for all his groups. So if you have uh, some skills or some uh, competencies related to uh, data management or analytics or whatever, just reach out to his group. You may get some opportunities there. So, yeah. I think that is uh, all I have to share with you in terms of uh, uh, economic opportunities working with uh, DHS2. So now the floor is yours if you have some questions for me, or if you have some uh, uh, testimonies or some experience you want to share with uh, the group here, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for sharing all this information. So my question is, I want to understand the relationship between the HISP group here at UIO and the HISP groups spread all over the world. 
like how is that relationship is it so binding can i like go say to malawi for example if there is not a hisp node and start a hisp node that is not in any way related to whatever network that exists i just want to understand that if they're independent or they're somehow managed centrally from uio thank you okay uh, let me ask this here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, that question i mean it's uh, it looks very simple but uh, sometimes it's uh, difficult to explain at least is uh, the answer is uh, complex for people so let me give it a try and uh, hoping that this time i will uh, get it right so yes uh, the his group here at uh, uio is uh, uh, his center is uh, like uh, the base or the one leading the dishes to work and uh, the other his group are also his group they are part of the broader community or the his network they are independent entities but they have the uh, MOU with uh, University of Oslo, uh, with uh, the HISP center here. But that's not uh, the unique things to do, but it's also about being part of a family. And that's why uh, you cannot uh, wake up in the morning and say, okay, I'm setting up his group here. Because you have to, it's a process where uh, you have to be trusted. So you start working with the community, you get known, the community make sure that you are there to our values, you understand our philosophy, our policies, and so forth. And then gradually you can, I mean, it's a process through which you are also getting support. So if you are not fully, yet, fully there yet, you'll be supported to get there. So it's a, a, a long process to make sure that you have all the skills that are needed. You know how we do business. You know our values. You know our ethics. You are there to them. And then at some point, you will be allowed to set up or you will be officially recognized as a his group. So it's a, actually a long process. And we are even now working on uh, making it uh, more uh, simpler and to have clear uh, requirements and also clear process in terms of time and also steps to become his group. So if you are interested, just stay tuned and uh, we'll uh, release those uh, steps later on. Hmm. All right, thank you. My name is Carl Smith. Uh, my question has to do with um, what are you guys doing to set up similar hips group in countries that uh, do not have one? Because uh, you may have countries that may have individual developers and some of them don't know the procedure, they don't have the resources to come to Oslo to connect. And uh, most times the hips group that's supporting those countries see those guys as a threat to their business model so they sometimes try to withhold information from them now i'm speaking from a personal experience i'm i'm from liberia and we don't have a hips group in liberia but we've been supported by uh, togo and then sometimes when we have uh the communication they come across that out of the sea us as a threat that we're trying to take business from there and sometimes when we talk to the guys from tanzania that support they also want to they see it as a threat so that is becoming a problem it's difficult to support because as we all know dhl school the local support for sustainability is very key so when you fly or expert in town they're going to stay for maybe two weeks three weeks but i live there 365 days so i'm there with the people i can speak their language pretty well and it's easier for me to be able to provide some of those adaptation uh, training for them. So I just wanted to figure out how, what's the procedure like, and how you, how you guys going to solve that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I think what people don't usually know is that in the 
same country, we may have many requests coming from many people. So how to decide we go with this one and we don't go with this one and so forth is, is difficult. And you may not know if things are moving forward with another group of people, for instance. So it's, uh, it's difficult. And as I said, it's, uh, you know, usually people see uh, these groups as uh, uh, something you set up today and uh, just that, and then it's, uh, uh, it's uh, fruitful, or at least you can have a, a positive uh, return uh, on uh, investment and so forth. I mean, the experience uh, shows that it's a long process. When you set up a his group, it's difficult to be sustainable. So, and that's why you need to have uh, committed people and to make sure that it's not necessarily about money, but it's about sharing values and it's about believing in uh, development and so forth. And it's difficult to, really difficult because in, uh, as I said, in some countries, uh, right now you have many groups or many organizations offering DHS to uh, support. That, that's fine. I mean, DHS is uh, open source. Everyone can use it. And if you can do business with it, it's, it's fine. But uh, to become a his group, as I said, it's a, it's a long process. And uh, if you are like alone in the country with that initiative, then it's easier to, to start that discussion with, with you. But again, there are many things involved to understand uh, where you are coming from, your background, what you are already doing, and so forth. If what you are doing is uh, compatible with uh, what we do, and so forth. And also, how you are also perceived in the country, because his group, we are usually neutral. So when you go to a country, we don't side with uh, anyone. We are just neutral. We try to, do, to work with everyone. So there are all these elements that need to be taken into account, and then the discussion will, uh, will start. So I think they, we don't necessarily need to come here to Oslo to become uh, his group. So it's just, you look at the websites, the community, you reach out, and so forth. In, if there are some uh, efforts on going, for instance, you are talking about uh, Liberia, I know that there is a his group in the process of uh, creation in Liberia right now, you see? So that is the reality of things in the, in the, in the country. So it's, uh, there's no clear answer. It depends on the context, uh, how many initiatives are there, uh, what is uh, the, the context of the, the country, uh, who are we talking with, uh, where is he coming from, is, it, is he known, and so, so you have all these elements that need to be taken into account. But I'm not the one deciding on who should be his group or not. And as I said, we are now working on uh, the, the requirement and also the, the processes that should be uh, published soon. So it will be easier for everyone to see if they qualified uh, to become his group or not. Or maybe can, if you have some experience to share with us, uh, we we'll also appreciate. If uh, in your case, because of DHS2, you have to leave the government and go for an NGO or World Bank or whatever. I mean, if you can feel free to share your experience as well. Or even if it's a bad experience, it's also welcome. I wanted to find out. Um, so, you, so when you speak about the in-country groups, and so you, you're speaking about things like communities of practice, and so which is different from the the his uh, the his group, correct? So is it that um the his group works with community of practices in different countries, and what are some of the services? If so, what are some of the things that you work, can do with community of practices in different regions? Okay, I mean the community of practice is maybe it's easier to start with his group. His group is usually an organization. It can be for profit or not for profit. And uh, it has uh, staff. It can, they can be 
10, 15, 20, hundreds, and so forth. But they are working for an organization. And the aim of that organization is to provide support to government in implementing information systems. It can be DHS2 or even not DHS2, like LMIS and other uh, platforms, for instance. So that is his group. And then beside that, you have the community of practice where you have everyone. It can be you, it can be the district uh, HMS officer, it can be a data entry clerk somewhere, it can be a consultant, but they are all in the same community of practice to share their experience, knowledge. If you have some concern you post, someone will uh, answer and uh, give you help or say, okay, maybe you talk to this other group or talk to this person and so So that is the community of practice. It's a place where people, uh, where we try to put this community where we can share knowledge, uh, share concerns, share experience, share opportunities and so forth. Where do they now come together? Or is there, or oh, it's just totally separate? That's really what I'm asking. No, I mean, the, the risk groups are also, for instance, we have this global community of practice, DHS2 community of practice with uh, a platform. And the his groups are also part of it. They are part of it as individuals, but the last time we discussed about uh, tagging them so that when they post someone from his group, post something, you can know that this person is coming from. Uh, a his group, which is different from someone who is not part of a his group. So they are there in the community of practice. They contribute to the community of practice. They can ask questions. They can also provide answers. They can uh, provide support and so on. But that is a place where everyone, the his groups out there, the his group here at the University of Oslo, all the independent uh, experts, the users, everyone, they are all together in that global community. And then you have also the possibility to set up your own community of practice within a country. And in that case, you can also bring his group in and other stakeholders in the national community of practice. Hi, my name is Alfred Umshanga from his group for his Mozambique. And it's a comment and question at some time. How do you balance the, the funds? I mean, the existing resource money and the work that needs to be done. So sometimes you can see a great opportunity of implementing a good system, but there are no, uh, there is no uh, enough resource for that. How do you balance uh, 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 the, the resource and the work to be done? I ask that because we know that usually in a business environment, if there is no money, I will not do the job because I will not spend my time there. So how do you balance that on your experience? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I guess we are talking about. Uh... Uh, resource, resource for uh, the, the technical assistance, not for the implementation. I think. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that is also the uh, peculiarity of uh, his groups. I mean, we have been doing this. I mean, we have been there out there for many years. And uh, the real support from uh, partners started only by, uh, uh, let's say, 2015 and so forth. So, it has been a long history of uh, pro bono work. So if you are part of a his group, is a matter of commitment to sustainable development. So if there is a need to do something that will have value for the government, then usually we just go and do it, even if there's no resources to do it. Because we believe in uh, what we are doing. If you know that the system you are supporting is uh, facing some great challenges, you cannot just sit and say, okay, I'm waiting for money to come before I support it. So you have to go there and support the system. And that is also part of the values of uh, this group. That's why a typical his group is different from a business, typical business organization. It's not about initially doing things for money, but it's about doing things for sustainability, doing things for development. So that's why you will see, I mean, in terms, we usually talk about uh, doing pro bono work and the ministries, if there are some people from ministries here, they will know that whenever there is uh, something they call his group, 
we don't talk about money. We just go and do the. If there's money involved, fine. If there's no money, we just go and do the work. And also, the other thing we do is, uh, what we usually do is, uh, we have some uh, supports, little support from here and there that we pull together, and we are just paying the the salary or the time of the, the staff. So it's not actually real consultancy based work, but it's uh, paying the, the salary of people. And that's why if we have resources from here and there, we pull it together, then we can do the work for uh, this program, this other program, even if the resources that we have is just for one program, then because we are able to pay people's time, then we can work with uh, everyone. So that's usually what we do. Even if money is not there, we are always committed and uh, we do the, the work. Yeah, thank you. So the last explanation that you just gave, I think has given rise to another question on my side. So what is like the sustainability plan for the HISP groups if you're saying you're not doing work necessary for money and this is an entity and I would consider it is a legal entity which has responsibilities for taxes and whatever. I don't know if it is a not-for-profit something, but even if still, where would you get the salaries, for example, for your staff if all you're doing is pro bono work? Yeah, that's, that's exactly why we, we are warning people to say, okay, this is not something where when you go into, you'll uh, instantly get money. Uh, in our case, we were we working for uh, many years without uh, specific funding. Sometimes you get uh, this small individual consultancy here and there, and then you have to live on something else and then work uh, on your time to support countries and so forth. So it's a uh, and then gradually, when you get known and so forth, you can uh, get some opportunities here and there, and you too need to you need to be well organized enough to have a clear mechanism whereby, with the funding that or the opportunities that you get, you make sure that you can pay at least your the time of your staff, and then the staff can uh, keep working on things, even if it's uh, for free. And so forth. But it's, uh, it's very hard in the beginning. And that's why, in the beginning, you need to have people who know that is a risk for them. They may be working for free without uh, full time salary or whatever. They have to be committed to it. But uh, if it's just like uh, mercenaries coming for uh, uh, salaries or fast salaries or, or uh, fees, high fees, then they will be disappointed. So that's the reality of the things. People need to know that it's not, if you're a his group, it doesn't mean that uh, you will get a uh, big contract and so forth. Even uh, we as existing or established his group, we are facing these uh, same challenges. UIO here is also uh, facing the, the same challenges. This year you can have uh, a contract and then next year, they will say, no, 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 we are no longer supporting you. You don't have money. Uh, then you stay there for one, two years before you get another contract. You need to find ways to, to survive. So it's not uh, a very, uh, it's not like uh, you are investing in a startup in a Silicon Valley where from uh, one month to another, your asset will grow to billions. And so, no, no, that's not the reality of his groups. <laughs> so the one part to it are his groups not for profit or are they for profit for it's, the legal part or it depends it's a mix, on it's a mix depending on uh, the country context in some countries they will say okay because you know and particularly when you are working in uh, African uh, countries there is always a risk if you are a non-profit, for instance, you may be at a higher risk because the government at any time can say, okay, we, 
you no longer have the, the license to operate as NGO, and then that's the end. But if you are like for profit, then it's, difficult, it's harder for the government to do such things. But in other countries, it's the opposite. So depending on the country context, people may choose to go for non-profit or for profit. Okay, so if uh, there is no more questions, thank you for uh, your attention and thank you for the interesting questions. Stay tuned about uh, the process of uh, becoming a HIST group. And uh, surely in the months to come, it will be released on the website. <laughs>